Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Karen Yarhimilo. I am the Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs here at Columbia University and the Adlai E. Stevenson Professor of International Relations. Thank you all for being here today to engage with a topic of incredible urgency and complexity. And a very special thanks to Brian Cohen uh, of the Craft Center for Jewish Life community for hosting this event here in their beautiful space. And also thank you to Ian Rottenberg. Ian, where? Here's Ian. And Columbia Religious Life for co-sponsoring today's event as well. In the United States and across the globe, we have witnessed a distressing surge in anti-Semitic incidents and rhetoric. This rise, which was already notable before the horrific attacks of October 7th, has become even more alarming since, with anti-Semitic incidents in the United States more than tripling in the three months that followed. Here in New York City, acts of anti-Semitism anti more than doubled from 2021 to 2023. And the number over the last four months is nearly double the same period one year ago. Lastly, since October 7, there have been more than 1,000 reported anti-Semitic incidents on college campuses. An unfortunate reality that we have even seen on our own campus. We must condemn all hateful language and acts. Yet we must go further than that. And we all know that the presence of anti-Semitism, just like all forms of hatred, often serves as an warning, an early warning sign of democratic backsliding, making the fight against it all the more critical. It is with this in mind that it is my privilege to introduce and welcome Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt the world's most preeminent scholars on anti-Semitism, for today's discussion of the rise of global anti-Semitism and what it means for democracy and stability. Having personally heard her in conversation with Secretary Hillary Clinton in Munich uh, in last, you know, was it two weeks ago, I can say that I am absolutely honored that she's here with, the CIPA, with us here, the SIPA community and Columbia community today. With a career marked by an unwavering dedication to truth, justice, and the fight against bigotry, Ambassador Lipstadt is someone we should all be inspired by. She's a distinguished historian and author known for her extensive work on Jewish studies and Holocaust history. She draws on decades of scholarship, teaching, and travels all around up to all corners of the world to meet with Jewish communities, rabbis, and foreign officials to discuss ways to combat hate speech, to combat discrimination and anti-Semitism. She also co-founded the Emory University TAM Institute for Jewish Studies and holds the position of the Rott Professors of Modern Jewish History and Holocaust Studies. In her current role as a U.S. Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism, Ambassador Lipstadt leads efforts to advance U.S. foreign policy to counter anti-Semitism throughout the world. She champions the values of democracy, human rights, and tolerance, working tirelessly to build bridges and foster understanding between nations. Today, Ambassador Lipstadt will talk with us about how defining, recognizing, and combating anti-Semitism is not just a moral imperative, but a vital, a vital component to preserve democracy. She will also discuss how anti-Semitism is often able to pass as rational discourse 
and how this trend has dire consequences for the preservation of free speech in communities around the world. Before I introduce SIPA's own Esther Fuchs, um, I want to highlight that today's discussion is part of a series of events that we will host this spring. The next will feature discussion on anti-Muslim hate, also co-sponsors with uh, Columbia Religious Life, and we will share more information about this event soon. And today's moderator is my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Esther Fuchs, in addition to serving for many years as director of SIPA's Urban and Social Policy Program, Esther has led a career distinguished by commitment to civic engagement and service, both inside and outside Colombia. As part of her extensive service to Colombia, she's a member of the Faculty Steering Committee of the Eric Holder Initiative for Civil and Political Rights, and also to the Provost uh, Just Society's Task Force at Columbia. And most recently, as you may know, in November, she was named by President Minou Shafiq to lead the university's task force on anti-Semitism. Now, please join me in extending warm welcome to Ambassador Deborah Lipschatt and Esther Fuchs. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Yuri Milo, my friend Karen, my dean, I say that with such pride, for your leadership and for all you're doing. It's, it's been so difficult and so important because you, in fact, have, promoting, have been promoting civil discourse on this campus and fact-based education. And that may be surprising to some people that that's actually something that has to be promoted, but it does. And Dean Yuri Milo has been at the forefront of ensuring that we remain one of the greatest universities in the country. And I, for one, want to thank you. Um, before I begin my conversation with the ambassador, which I am a little bit starstruck oh, about, sorry. just have to say that up front, um, I want to tell everybody that the ambassador will be taking questions at the end. So hold on, because I know there will be many, and she has agreed to take live questions. So let's begin. And I think the place to begin, and it would be very helpful for all of us in this room, would be for you to simply tell us a little bit, and I know it's a big question to start, about your role as special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. This is not you know, a cookie cutter position mm -hmm. in government. I can say that as a political scientist who knows American government, sort of, I hope. Uh, I, don't, I think you're the first one to be in this position and that you were appointed by the president. And I, I think a lot of people don't really know. What Actually, it's about. I'm not, there have been special envoys before me. In fact, uh, it started, uh, I think, under George W. Bush, and then uh, subsequent. So we've had both sides of the aisle. We've had uh, special envoys. I am, however, the first person to hold it at the ambassadorial level, okay. which in, in government speak means a lot. Yes. Because it means that you've been nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate, as opposed to solely or simply, however you want to put it, uh, appointed by uh, the Secretary of State. So meant that it go through a Senate confirmation process, which some of you may know, may not know, was a little bit stretched out and <laughs> elongated, but that ended in uh, positively. So that's, that's, and when you're the ambassador, that's the highest rank you can have in the State Department, other than, of course, uh, an undersecretary or the, um, the secretary himself. Uh, but you are representative of the administration in that, in that respect. And my job, because I'm in the State Department and the way that, and when the Congress set up this position, is to uh, keep my focus on anti-Semitism abroad, outside uh, the country, and I have no dearth of uh, activities to keep me involved or to be uh, attuned to. Uh, I sometimes say only a little, little bit in jest 
I work in a growth industry and business is booming. Uh, I may be the only one in the Biden-Harris administration who's hoping for a recession, you know? Um, and I say it, as I say, minusculely in jest and, and with a, a great degree of seriousness. Um, but um, that, that's, that's the main focus. So what does that mean? Uh, it used to be, from my predecessors, um, that they could go to a country, let's say, after the horrific events in, in Paris of Charlie Hebdo or the Batiklan, the theater where, where people were murdered, Charlie Hebdo, where the, the uh, uh, editorial staff of the magazine was murdered and that was followed by the attack on the hyper kosher, the kosher supermarket. Um, and say, you have a problem, and we in the United States see this as a serious thing. What can, are you taking it seriously? What can we do to help you take it seriously, et cetera? I can't do that because I have to go and say, we have a problem. And we have a problem, you, not, often not dissimilar, sometimes less bad, sometimes worse, in the United States. Um, but I have been, I think in the year and a half I've been in office, I've made 29 different country visits. Um, so I get a lot of frequent flyer miles, but I don't have any time to use them, so they're <laughs> it's useless. Um, but something has become clear to me, and it, it was clear to me already before October 7th, but it has become even clearer since October 7th, and it's reflected in the title that the dean, and thank you for that lovely introduction, I, I appreciate it. My mother would have believed it, uh, every <laughs> word of it, uh, and I know where you're exaggerating, but I really appreciate it. Um, something's been clear to me, and I think this is very important in our approach to anti-Semitism. And it's something that I've been sharing with governments overseas and in conversation in our own government, particularly with uh, people in the National Security Council at the White House and the intelligence, different intelligence agencies, et cetera. Um, that it's imperative that we, we think of anti-Semitism as more than just, and I put just in quotation marks, a threat to the welfare of Jews and the Jewish community. And were it just that, it would be something that would be valid for a government to fight. Um, by the way, this position was established by the Congress at points as it saw the rise of anti-Semitism and felt this was something that was serious and in part, though unarticulated, for some of the reasons I'm going to lay out. Um, and that is, it's, it's, it's a, we have to take a multi-layered approach or multi-leveled approach. So bottom line, of course, is a threat to Jews and the Jewish community. And were it just that, I again reiterate, no one should think that I'm saying, oh, that's not important. That would be a valid thing for a government to be aware of and, and, and to address itself to. Because essentially, governments act, if I might, and the political scientists here, you in, included, might cringe at this, in loco parentis. Their, their job is just like a parent's job. What's a parent's job? It's to keep the kids safe. And each parent defines safe, uh, you know, some define it as giving them a world-class education, others define it as just making sure they don't fall out of the pram or out of the stroller. Um, but they, their job is because a child is vulnerable. And in that same sense, certainly in democracies, government's jobs are to keep their citizens safe, particularly, not only, but particularly the vulnerable citizens. That's why governments have jobs about child labor. That's why they have jobs about elderly. That's why you have jobs about water safety and air safety. You, you want to protect your population. But it's more than just that. It's also a threat to democracy. Why do I say that? Um, I say that because anybody who buys into the conspiracy myth, and I do not say conspiracy theory because theories can be proven, but to the conspiracy myth, which is the cornerstone of anti-Semitism, has accepted the notion, the far-fetched notion, that old Yiddish word, far-fetched, you know? Uh, <laughs> the far-fetched, it's good to be in New York where some people at least get some of these, some right. people get we these. We can jokes. at least laugh yes, a little. Right. Um, notion that the Jews control the banks, the media, the Jews control the electoral process, et cetera, et cetera, um, has essentially given up on democracy. But it's more than just that. And that brings me to the third le level, sort of straddling uh, the threat to democracy and to national security and stability, um, is that 
bad actors, whether they come from within the United States or they come from outside the United States, in the American intelligence community, we refer to them as malign influencers. Very, I love that word. It's got a lot of extra syllables in it. So, um, But bad actors, again, they can be within our country. They can be outside our country. They can be governments. They can be NGOs, organizations. They can be individuals but use anti-Semitism as a tool to make, particularly often uh, pe these are people who are authoritarian or authoritarian governments who can make um, democracy seem like failed states. Um, so that anti-Semitism becomes uh, the, the cooking spoon, kachlafel in Yiddish, you know, the cooking spoon to stir up the pot and make people in a democracy feel that the democracy uh, can't quite protect you or make the democracies look bad. And I think that's what we're seeing as well, which of course then becomes a threat to national security and stability, not just of our nation, but of other nations and particularly of democracies. Okay, so uh, you said a lot for the first question, which is actually perfect because I wanna now help us unpack uh, some of the really, really important points that you made. So we on the task force, there's a number of us here, you know, have been asked over and over again this question of how do you define anti-Semitism? Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have not in our task force for a variety of reasons. But I think it would be really important in this context for us to back up a little uh, for the especially for the students here, and get, get the definition of anti-Semitism as it's used by the State Department. Okay, the State Department has embraced uh, the IRA definition, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, a definition which has become much maligned, including by people who have never read it. <laughs> of um, course. <laughs> because uh, the one very strong critic of it whose office was heavily criticizing it was given it to read and said, this is good, I like this, you know. It is a working definition, i.e. non-legally binding. And it is a quite a nuanced and rather simple definition, um, dissent, arguing that it can be uh, anti-Semitism as a perception of Jews, a negative perception of Jews, or those who people think are Jews. You know, um, and often it's not, not a Jew, but it's someone who is associated with Jews or is perceived to be a Jew. And then it gives a list of examples which are based on uh, studies that were done and surveys that were done, particularly of European Jews, of uh, what was their lived experience of encountering anti-Semitism. Right. And if you look at the definition, I urge you to do so, those those examples are introduced by a sentence that these examples may or may not can constitute anti-Semitism depending on the context, the word which in academic worlds after that, that disastrous <laughs> hearing on yeah. Capitol Hill has, has a loaded meaning but still is a useful word. Um, so it's a definition that guides us in that sense um, and guides the work we do. There are other definitions. I mean, I think uh, one of them says, the IRA definition is no good, and we come to replace it. You know, so that one is sort of we had a, we've embraced the other, and we don't think that other one works as well. And there are definitions that are strictly uh, geared to the American political scene, and this is has a much yeah. broader international context. And it's been a useful guideline for us uh, in in identifying anti-Semitism. Bottom line, however, and this is not entirely sufficient. But for many of us, uh, you know, uh, anti-Semitism is also defined uh, or not defined by the most famous statement ever to come out of the American Supreme Court, Potter Stewart, Justice Potter Stewart, on pornography, on a Louis Mal film for the film buffs here. I think it was The Kiss or The Lover, I forget which one. Um, and uh, he said, I can't define pornography, but... I know it when I see, see it. it. Right. So you I'm know, we so often, glad you said this often, because I've said this also, and people. You know, like, it, we used to talk about uh, friends of mine who were gay said they had gaydar. You know, they could gay. spot. And sometimes <laughs> Jews on the Upper West Side talk about Judar. Uh, <laughs> you know, so maybe it's anti-Semitism dar. I don't know. Yeah. No, this is very important because you know, 
there's a lot of people who think you can't even proceed to have a discussion without some precise definition, and clearly that's meant to deflect the mm -hmm. conversation. And, you know, we have our particular issues, of course, as it plays out locally, as you alluded to, in the United States. But, and I know your job is really global uh, at the State Department. And, you know, I'm wondering if you've thought about, I know you have written about this, but if you thought about it in the context of your work, um, and as it's playing out now, both globally and as it connects to the local, which is to say, what, are, what do you see as the sources now of contemporary anti-Semitism? It's, it's a complicated question. Um, first of all, let me step back for a moment, give you a longer answer. I think, first of all, to think of it, you have to think of anti-Semitism as a prejudice, akin, operating similarly to a panoply of other prejudices. You name it, they act the same way. The person in question does something bad, Ah, that's how they all are. The person who does something good, oh, that's one of the good ones. And that can be uh, particularly with racism in this country, with misogyny, with uh, uh, Muslims, it, it, it just you know, across the board, that's how it operates. However, I think you also have to recognize, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about the conspiracy myth, that there's certain unique characteristics to anti-Semitism <sighs> that make it different from the other prejudices. And I'm not playing, uh, you know, uh, uh, privileging one prejudice over the other. That's a fool's errand, you know, and it's sort of comparative pain. If I were to walk in here and say I can't really speak because I have an impacted tooth and someone would say, oh, I have two impacted teeth, <laughs> I wouldn't feel the least bit better. So, you know, <laughs> a comparative pain is a, is a useless task. But... Um, the unique aspect of anti-Semitism is, first of all, this conspiracy myth idea that I mentioned earlier. And, and, and that can best be explained by talking about, which I've written about um, a bit, and it's, I'm, I'm quoted on, the punching up, punching down syndrome. Uh, most ethnic uh, prejudices uh, punch down, certainly if you take the issue of racism, in our country, I live in it when I'm, not, I'm now live in Washington, but I've been living in Atlanta for a long time, which, as we like to say in Atlanta, is a city surrounded on four sides by Georgia. Um, <laughs> you know, and the further north you go out of Atlanta, the more in the deep south you are, but every once in a while I do take myself out of there. Um, there, if you take, let's say, the racist, the racist. The racist looks on the person of color, the black person, and says, oh, that person's okay, not as smart as I am, not as talented as I am, not as hardworking as I am, and they're okay as long as they know their place, mm -hmm. a term that has a long history in, uh, in racism, particularly in American racism. Uh, they're fine, but they shouldn't move into our neighborhood. If they move into our neighborhood, there goes the property values. Their kids shouldn't go to our kids' school because they're not as smart enough, they're not as good enough. In other words, they're okay as long as they're kept down, as long as they know their place. We need them. We need them to function and to, run, and to work in our society, et cetera. Um, you have that punching down syndrome in anti-Semitism, particularly, but not only vis-a-vis -vis Haredi Jews, ultra-Orthodox Jews, they, they're dirty, they spread COVID, all that kind of thing. We saw a lot of that in recent years. But there's an added element in anti-Semitism, which you don't have in the other ethnic religious um, prejudices, any of them, that I, or vast majority of them, and that's the punching up part. Because if you take the template, the stereotypical template of the anti-Semite. Every prejudice has a template, has a certain number of characteristics, and those characteristics are not transferable. Shiftless, lazy, mafioso, uh, high-pitched, unreliable, flighty, each of those move, belong to a different, a different prejudice, and you can't, they're not interchangeable. The te prejudicial template for anti-Semitism, something to do with money, something to do with smarts, but not positive smarts, right. crafty, clever, conniving, something to do with punching above your weight, small number, but they know how to operate behind the scenes, and something to do with, well, since these things really come out of, to my mind, they're traceable, to the deicide story in the New Testament and how, listen carefully, how that story was used 
by subsequent generations. I'm not saying it had to be this way, but how that story was used. Um, the, the, uh, the actions of the devil. What are the, act what are the characteristics of the devil in Christian theology? That the devil was the only one who could harm God. Look what the Jews did. Of course, the New Testament is a story about Jews, by Jews, for Jews. Uh, you know, so it, but, but that doesn't, that's not how it was interpreted. And the devil, the other characteristic of the devil is that he does his handiwork, it's a he, he does his handiwork and is gone before you know you've encountered the devil. So mm -hmm. it's that sneaky characteristic. Now, by the way, just as a historian, I want to make it clear that anti-Semitism may, some people actually say it has its roots before Christianity in Alexandria, Egypt, and there, but, you know, what, whatever, it moves way outside the church. You know, it starts in, in Judea, it starts in Jerusalem in the early years, then it moves, of course, to and evolves in Rome, and then, you know, uh, further up uh, Martin Luther, Protestantism, you have elements of anti-Semitism, uh, or anti-Judaism, as the historian David Nirenberg calls it, um, uh, in Islam. And then, of course, it moves out of religion into uh, socialism, communism, uh, you know, uh, anti clericalism Voltaire in, in France, uh, who when he, he hated the power of the Catholic Church, but when he wrote about Jews, he could have been the most anti-Semitic uh, uh, church father as they existed in the fourth or fifth or sixth later centuries. Um, so you have to think of it in that way uh, in relation to other hatreds. So when you are encountering anti-Semitism you know, in, the, in our existing life right now, um, one of the things that has struck many of us in this room and that we see is that it exists on the left and the right in the political sphere. Mm -hmm. And I think what you've just said is really instructive and helpful about the origins for understanding this. But, I, you know, I'd appreciate, I think, if, if you could help us with this uh, issue of... Um, how did it grow simultaneously on the left and the right? And then you alluded in, your, in the beginning of your remarks, and I think this will bring you back to that, which is really this issue of how it's been exploited yes. politically right, right. Um, okay. to undermine democracies uh, in the world. One of the other characteristics, in addition to the conspiracy theory and the punching up and punching down, is its ubiquity, <laughs> ah. free-flowing moving across the political, every place on the political spectrum. It can come from left, right, center, center left, center right. It can come from Christians, it can come from Muslims, it can come from atheists, it can come from Jews. It is ubiquitous. I, I had the privilege of serving as a expert witness, witness in the Charlottesville trial. The trial, the case brought by the people who, the family of Heather Heyer, who was murdered at the, at, by the car, if you remember the, in the post the rally on Saturday afternoon, and people who were um, beaten up, abused, uh, physically hurt yeah. um, during the Charlottesville rally, march and rally. And I was asked by the, to, to explain to the court and to the jury um, why it was in a uh, march ostensibly about removing uh, uh, civil rights, uh, civil, civil war, war excuse me, civil war, I have to differentiate, civil war statues, there was so much anti-Semitism, so much Nazi uh, uh, iconography, uh, rhetoric, symbolism, etc. Um, and the point I made is that of this ubiquitous quality of anti-Semitism, that it can come from, from everywhere. And in fact, rather than thinking of a spectrum right-left, I, I like to think of a horseshoe, a, ma a magnetic horseshoe, where the one end of the horseshoe and the other end of the horseshoe meet together. And, and that sort of better depicts anti-Semitism. Um, and it can be used. Look, you had it from the most uh, uh, rabid church leaders, not all of them, but many of them over, over millennia. And then Karl Marx, who had no use for the church, in case you haven't read Karl Marx. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I'm not sure that it's worth going through everything, but you can believe me on this, you know. Um, uh, it, it shows up there. It shows up the communists. The communists, uh, the in, in the 1920s, 
they start a campaign not against uh, Zionism, but against, uh, not against anti-Semitism uh, or Jews, but against ostensibly Zionism, which was growing. Um, but it's an anti-Semitic campaign, and you have it in, um, in the communist regime. You know, uh, the, the communists or people on the left will say Jews are capitalists and control everything, and capitalists will say Jews are all revolutionaries and trying to overthrow things. One group will say Jews are pushy and try to get into places where they're not wanted, and others will say Jews are clannish and stick together. And some people will say the same things all at the same time. And last time I checked, you can't be both of those things, you know, <laughs> clannish. And, 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 and pushy at the same time. Uh, I think that's very helpful. And I, uh, you know, it's, it's still, I still find it in, incredibly uh, distressing that the rise of anti Semitism, both on the left and the right in the United States, is happening on the same time. I, I like the metaphor of the horseshoe. But, um, I think part of it is in your global work, maybe you can tell us more about that too, we're seeing anti-Semitism used to undermine democracies. Yes. And you mentioned that earlier, and I think to elaborate on that would be very helpful, and maybe it connects to this ability of anti-Semitism mm -hmm. to be the ubiquitous right. devil, as you Look, um, explain. Look, if uh, they're, they're, as I call them, bad actors or malign influencers, and they can be states, they can be other nations, particularly autocratic nations. Um, they can be uh, organizations, NGOs, organized or not. They can be individuals. And if many of them have an interest in showing democracies as failed states, making right. them look as failed states. So again, if you can um, make a, a democracy look like a place that isn't such a great place to speak very, you know, sort of simplistically, um, that can't protect its citizens, that claims it has freedom but really doesn't, doesn't um, that's in your interest. I'll give you an example from history and from contemporary times, historically. In late 1959, early 1960, there was an outbreak of anti-Semitism in the FRG, the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany. Uh, cemeteries were desecrated, newly built synagogues. There were very few Jews there, but they felt, you know, let's at least rebuild the synagogues, um, had swastikas painted on them. It was a, a campaign that then spread to other countries, including this country. Um, and uh, it was just at the time, 5960, when Germany was making a, a big push as to be seen as a, a reliable Western ally, a reliable democracy, uh, all sort of trades deals, et cetera, et cetera, were underway. Well, fast forward quite a few decades, and as a result of defections from uh, the USSR to the West, we learned unequivocally that uh, this was a campaign that began with one small incident in West Germany and then was taken on by the KGB and the Stasi. Wow. Yeah. Um, and uh, they ha did have a problem, though. They, well, what they, why would they care to do this? Because they were trying to say, oh, you think West Germany is a, is a reliable ally? Remember then you have West Germany, East Germany. East Germany says, of course, all the Nazis, they, their post-Shoah, uh, post-Holocaust post interpretation was this was really a uh, attempt by the fascists to destroy the, the, the communists and the, people, and the people on the left, and they're all in West Germany. The bad people are in West Germany. The good people are all in East Germany. So it was an attempt to make make uh, West Germany look like a failed state. Uh, they did have a problem, however, in, in that they, if they were too successful, they would make the Nazis, these were not neo-Nazis, these were Nazis, look good, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, it was a way of, of rousing doubts about Germany. Fast forward to October 2023, and there is in Paris, I arrived in Paris for meetings in, with French government officials, high-ranking French government officials, and meetings at UNESCO shortly after this happened. There were a swastika, Jewish stars, excuse me, painted on apartment houses in which Jews lived. And now it's been shown uh, conclusively that the people who organized that were a couple from Moldova, 
who hired people to do that and left for Moldova or left the France uh, before they could be apprehended. And let's turn to this country. Um, in January of this year, late December, I think it was actually in January already, uh, about 200 synagogues were called and told, you have bomb threats, et cetera. Um, and many of the synagogues evacuated, especially if they had preschools and things things like that. And now the FBI has shown that the calls, those calls all came from outside the United States. <laughs> so what's going on here? We look at PRC, uh, China, um, uh, controlled websites. You know, websites on which only uh, materials cleared by the Chinese government can, can be placed, and we see overt anti-Semitism. What's, what's going on here? Um, and we don't know. With the Chinese, we don't know. I'm not talking as if, if I knew, I probably couldn't tell, but so I don't right. know. Um, uh, but um, basically, a, sup a good supposition would be that this is one of the ways of trying to make America look like a, you think democracy is so great. It also figures, of course, into the current war in the Middle East. You know, Israel, America is seen as, uh, as, as, and is uh, uh, expressed in support of Israel, and we are for the other side, et cetera. So before I open it up to questions, I, I really want to ask you one last question to connect what you've been saying to the mission of the university and the mission of a public policy school as well. Um, what do you think we should be doing? I know this is a mm -hmm. terrible question, but mm -hmm. I'm asking it anyway. What do you think we should be doing on campus? Well, I have my prescriptions right here. I'll give them to okay. you. OK, OK, fair if enough. If only, if only, if only. Look, if I had an easy answer, right. I would have written it up and made sure every president of every university and the heads of every uh, commission got it, et cetera. There is no easy answer. Right. But there are certain things that have to be done. I think first and foremost, we have to take this threat seriously, yes. going back to what I said earlier. And not just based on what I said earlier, but there has been an inclination, certainly on universities, not only on universities' campuses, to say, ah, what are they complaining about? They're all going back to the I anti- I should share my email with yeah. you, yes. You're, you're getting all, that right. You're all rich, you're all white, you're all powerful, you know, what are you complaining about? Now, I'd, I'd like to point out that many people, particularly in the gay community, in the LGBTQ community, are quite comfortable. Not all of them, of course, that would be, a, a, and many of them, the leadership, certainly in the beginning, as, as people came, came out of the closet, to use the euphemism, um, and, and uh, openly expressed their gay identity, were well-established, were white. Would anybody say that they shouldn't be protected? Right. I mean, it makes no sense. Um, in England, where I just was until two days ago, um, uh, amongst the, the most successful ethnic group are people from India, India Asia. You know, we'd say, oh, you're wealthy, don't be protect, we can't protect you. So there, there's been a tendency here internalizing the anti-Semitism yeah. by people who would who would die, who would shrivel up if you ever pointed out to them and proved to them that they've internalized the anti-Semitism. But what are the Jews complaining for, about? On top of which, there's been a depiction in, in recent years of uh, the Jew as oppressor, the Jew as colonizer. Yes. For, let me make something very clear. Jews can do things wrong. Some of the people I hate most are Jews, you know? <laughs> uh, people I can't stand, you know? Um, wow. And I could list them for you afterwards, you know? But, um, and they know Welcome who they to are. Welcome my world. <laughs> right. Um, but, but, and this is not about individual actions. Yeah. Jews, blacks, Muslims, gay people, straight people, women can do terrible things. But it's when you begin to talk about the in yeah. a all-encompassing way. And you begin to put all the wrongs on the group, if only they did X, Y, and Z. And I think on campuses, and it's particularly shocking on campuses, because campuses are supposed to be the bastions of uh, liberal thought and open thought on that, there has been falling into that um, stereotypical way of thinking. Um, or 
thing, seen uh, in one very fine university that, that I know of, there was an anti-Semitic incident. The uh, one young student, very bright student, went to the uh, office of uh, whatever DEI, whatever, however it was con constructed on that university. The person in charge listened very seriously, took it very seriously, and then said, I, I think this is a real problem, and I want you to wait here while I call the chaplain of the university and the Office of Religious Life so that they can deal with it. And the student said, this has nothing to do with my religion. This has, you know, but there's a failure to understand, I think, and a failure to accept the fact that institutions whose raison d'etre, whose very reason for being is thinking and reason for liberal acceptance and acceptance of all groups and being against injustice and all that, could themselves have fallen into uh, anti-Semitic ways of thinking, whether consciously or unconsciously. So that's a, l a long way of saying that's what I mean by take it seriously, A. B, I think when you have rules and regulations, live up to those rules yes. and regulations. It's the same thing I say when I meet heads of uh, and uh, officers of online platforms where, you know, because of uh, Missouri v. Biden and other things, we don't, we're very, we're very limited in what we can say to them. And, uh, but we can say to them, you, you say you don't uh, tolerate hate speech, you don't tolerate racism, you don't tolerate anti semitism Show us, do, live up to your very examples. And I think it's time for universities to do that. And part of that calls for taking a look in the mirror and acknowledging your, your wrongdoings, acknowledging your shortcomings. You know, I, was, I had the privilege of being in, in conversation with uh, Pope Francis. Uh, actually, I was in, in Rome on October 7th, and I, I, I was with him October 10th or something like that. And um, uh, one of the reasons I was there is the, he has given permission after many of his predecessors had said, yes, we'll do it, they never did it, for the opening of the archives, uh, particularly oh. in relation to World War II. Wow. And uh, they had sat on them because there's some very bad stuff in there about what the Vatican did not do and in fact did do during that period. Um, so I was there for a conference on that, and, and I, I, uh, the, the Vatican said, you know, we'll arrange a, a private audience with the Holy Father. And, um, of course, I talked to him at that point about the hostages, and I talked to him about the need for uh, education for uh, clerics, and whether it be priests, nuns, teachers, whatever, uh, who are trained by the Vatican, not just to learn about the Shoah, the, how Jews died, but also to learn about Jews as a living entity. Um, but first, I, I wanted to thank him uh, for having opened the archives, because his predecessors had said, but never did it. Um, and I know, because I've met them, there are people who work at the archives and run some of the archives who are very much opposed to this whole opening. So he, he was bucking some of the deep, the, if the Vatican has a deep state, he was bucking some of the, the deep state of the <laughs> Vatican. Um, and he said to me, very tasse, very, there were just the two, two of us in the room and his interpreter, because he spoke Spanish a part of the, most of the time. Um, very tasse, very tasse, you know, truth is truth. And I said to him, in vino e very tasse. I couldn't believe I was making a, cracking a bad <laughs> joke with the, the head of a billion Catholics, but I did. <laughs> But more importantly, I said to him, and I think this is important for universities, that's why I'm bringing it up. I, I, I reminded him of the story of the Joseph story. Mm -hmm. When Joseph in the, in the book of Exodus is in um, the, actually in the book of Genesis, is in the uh, prison, uh, he's put in the prison unfairly, and he interprets the dream for the butler and the baker. And the baker says to the baker, you're going to be executed, and the butler, you're going to be returned to your position as Pharaoh's butler. And, um, but when you go, please tell Pharaoh that there's a Jewish lad here who is being, uh, Nar Ivri, a Jewish lad, who's being held unfairly in the, um, in the prison. And of course, the butler gets uh, uh, re uh, reinstated and not atypically forgets Joseph. Then Pharaoh has his dreams and he needs someone to interpret them, and the, and the butler says, uh, remembers Joseph. But he begins, I said to the Pope, he, when he goes to Pharaoh to say, there's a young lad who, who interpreted the dream and got it just right, 
um, my dreams, you know, and got them just right, uh, and he could interpret your dreams, dreams, he begins with the phrase, et chata'ayani maskir hayom, my sins do I acknowledge today. Oh, and right. I said that that, I said, you come from a confessional faith, I come from a confessional mm. faith. Of course, Judaism, you don't confess to a person, but you've got to confess to the person you wronged before you can ask forgiveness. I said, and you know, and that's very important that you're willing to acknowledge your wrong, wrongs, at which point the Pope turned to his interpreter and said, she's a good theologian, <laughs> which my colleagues at Emory thought was hysterical because they know I'm a historian and I don't get theology at all. But I have been declared by the Pope a good theologian. So I think what well, could be bad? Uh, that is helpful for us today, right? Okay, we're going to be able to take some questions. So please just put your hand up. The mics will come to you. We're going to take a series of questions at once to maximize uh, participation. And um, where are the mics? Great. So why don't we start over here? Okay. Can you talk about the slide from uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Israel? Um, can you talk about the slide that we see now from anti-Zionism and anti-Israel to anti-Semitism, um, the relationship? Sure. Okay. okay, let's get the next question. Somebody over here? Yeah. Um. Can you talk about campus anti well it's a similar question. Uh, like when does campus anti Zionist activism turn into anti Semitism? Okay, like so where more. is the line? Go so okay, thank you. Okay, and let's take one more right here and then we'll go for the back one over there. So Can four, you talk about the deal. news, like how it's uh, feeding, I think it's feeding anti-Semitism, even though the they're not anti Semitic, you know, they wanna sell more newspapers, but the constant um, images that we see certainly feed it. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. And one more in the back. Thank you so much for being here, and I say this with respect to the anti-Semitism task force. Do you think that university anti-Semitism can be held accountable from within the university, or it needs to be held accountable from outside of the university? Okay, all right. More, or that's it? I give you okay. four, and then we'll go for another okay. round afterwards. The first question, and both, a couple of the questions sort of uh, follow, in the relationship to anti-Israel, anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism. Uh, it's almost unnecessary to say, but because many of the people who engage in anti-Semitism in the guy or whose criticism of Israel morphs into anti-Semitism and then claim they're only being held accountable because they're critical of Israel. Um, criticism of the state of Israel is not anti-Semitism. Just like criticism of American policy is not anti-Americanism. You know, if you've been, spent any time in Israel, you will know that the national sport is not football or what we call soccer. It's criticism of the government. You know, and you sit in a cafe, depending who's in power, if it's one side, you sit in the cafe in Tel Aviv or Herzliya or Ranana, and you hear criticism of the government. If it's another, uh, if it's a different kind of government, you sit in, in Jerusalem or, or Beit Shemesh and you'll hear criticism. Everybody knows best. You know, if criticism of the state of Israel were anti-Semitism, the hundreds of thousands of Israelis who were on the street every Saturday night for seven months uh, to protest the proposed judicial reform would be anti-Semites, and that, of course, is ludicrous because that group became the group that pivoted most quickly uh, to respond to the October 7th. Uh, uh, situation. So that's not what we're talking about. But if your criticism is not criticism of policy, but a saying that the state of Israel has no right to exist uh, because it's a theocracy, because uh, whatever your reason, then that is already coming close to the line. Um, if you t because, oh, well, they shouldn't exist and the, and the Jews should leave uh, or go back to where they came from. Of course, many of the people who are there are from uh, countries from which they were kicked out. Um, what you're essentially saying is that half the Jews in the world should be displaced, A, and B, um, that of all, there is one Jewish state, there are, you know, dozens of other states that are Muslim, that are Christian, that um, 
Buddhist, etc., um, doesn't have a right to exist. And then I think you're getting very close to the line. That is not, and again, I feel uh, stupid having to say this, but I know if I don't say it, it'll be misinterpreted. That's not saying that everything Israel does is right or that you agree with all its policies. Of course not. It's a democracy and it does lots of things wrong. And many people, including uh, the government that I serve in, is very critical of the current policies. And that's just fine, but it's when, we, when it crosses the line. And the other thing that happens um, is that we've, and this we've seen since October 7th, and both your questions sort of point at it, to some degree, that question, I'm the wrong person to ask that question. The person, the people you have to ask that question to, who are in the name of their opposition to uh, Israel's actions, um, even before Israel took any actions, and you know the days right after, for instance, in Sydney at the si iconic Sydney Opera House, the protesters who protested f the Jews and gas the Jews, and some of them denied that they were chanting gas the Jews. They were saying, "Where are the Jews?" Well, that's pretty ominous too. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> you know, it's not not a whole lot better. Oh. Um, that's anti-Semitism. Or the people who torched a synagogue in Philadelphia, Montreal, that's anti-Semitism. Or the basketball team up here in uh, the game, the girls' basketball game in Westchester oh, County, God. where the, the, the high school girls were from the Jewish school, I think it's the Solomon Schechter school, were abused by the other team um, and pushed and shoved and free power. That's anti-Semitism. Um, uh, the, the Hamas terrorist who called his mother and said, I just killed 10 Yahudim, that's anti-Semitism. Um, you know, so that on some level, the line has been crossed by many of the people committing these acts, and there are dozens of other acts that I could mention. So, um, and it's not, that's not being pro-Palestinian either. That's not helping Palestinians one, one whit. Um, it's, it's, you know, so that, that is, I think, where you see the line being crossed. In terms of media, look, the, the pictures, and I should have said this in the beginning, anybody who is not disturbed by the death of children, irrespective of their identity, is someone who doesn't have a heart. Anybody who doesn't recognize the suffering that is going on, irrespective of their particular political procliv proclivities, doesn't have a heart. You know, um, uh, I, I heard one rabbi, um, an Orthodox rabbi, talking about the um, plague of darkness, where the Egyptians, where everything went very dark, and he said, but the Israelites could see. And the rabbis asked, how is that possible? And one of the interpretations was that um, the uh, of Egyptians couldn't see the suffering of their fellow Egyptians. And they contrasted, he contrasted that to Moses, who comes out of the palace, you know, after having been raised by Pharaoh's daughter, and he sees the suffering of, so not to be able to see, and that Orthodox rabbi said, I can't look at the suffering of the Palestinians without seeing their suffering. You can hold both thoughts in your head at the same time. Um, so the pictures of the media are quite difficult, and media doesn't give nuance. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's a complicated situation in that uh, sense. University anti-Semitism goes back to what I said earlier, um, that universities have been uh, afraid, afraid, you know, they're, they're, some of the administrators have jelly for backbones, I don't know, you know, um, <laughs> but some have, some have taken it on, but sometimes in a clumsy fashion with good intentions, um, but sometimes afraid to really address this. And sometimes the fear we see in, is in small ways, for instance, when there's an act of anti-Semitism, not just in universities, we see this in corporations, we see this in governments, local governments, etc. cetera, uh, they, the, there's a condemnation of anti-Semitism and racism, homophobia, Islamophobia, da, 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 da. Now, I'm not saying there's any reason to be for those things or not to condemn those things, but imagine if the George Floyd was murdered in this country by four policemen suffocating him, essentially, which was an act of racism, pure and simple. 
Um, if, if people who were condemning it had condemned the racism which motivated the murder of George Floyd and misogyny and homophobia, it would have been, people said, what are you talking about? You have to call, I've learned this from, in fact, from, from training that was done, there's an Office of Racial Equity at the, at the uh, special uh, 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 reporter, uh, envoy, I, I guess, uh, um, on racial equity in our foreign policy, sort of parallel to me. Um, and she brought in, she did a training session for those of us uh, in segments of the, of the State Department. And the trainer said, you have to call something out for what it is, racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, misogyny. Then you can place it in the larger context. But if you just sort of make this big mishmash um, it's, you know, let's sing Kumbaya. I don't know if you still, I'm, I'm aging, I'm dating myself. Watch <laughs> the Joan Baez documentary, you'll see it there. Um, and everything will be okay. Um, and there, there hasn't been that, reluct, that same reluctance uh, with some of the other hatreds, which, are, which, and again, I'm not privileging one, but too often either it's not there or it's only there in the context of other hatreds. Well, I wish we had time for a lot more questions. Unfortunately, the hour is nearing its end. I, I could sit here for more hours with you. Thank you. Uh, I just can't thank you enough, Ambassador, you know, for you know, both a candid and an illuminating discussion. Um, as you know, we have an anti-Semitism task force here, and we've been listening to students and we know that our Jewish students who came to Columbia did not expect to be experiencing anti-Semitism on campus. And that they're angry, and they're sad, and they're confused, and they're heartbroken. The Hillel has been a refuge, but we know that's not enough. You have made it abundantly clear to us today that's not enough. It cannot be simply <laughs> making nice to people, looking at this as a mental health issue. President Shafiq, Dean Yuri Milo, are committed to ensuring the Jewish students are safe and welcome on campus, and they're promoting civil discourse and discussion across difference. And that, in my view, can only succeed when lies are challenged and facts are agreed upon. And Ambassador Lipstadt, your presence today has been a critical part of that process. And we, everyone in this room, I know I'm really speaking for the entire campus, can't thank you enough for coming to Columbia today and sharing both your thank insights you. and experiences. Thank you, thank you. Let me add a word because you said something there that, that made me very sad. Um, but I know it's true and I know it's true not just on this campus, that Jewish students are afraid uh, some are living defensively, uh, wearing a baseball cap instead of a kippah. But, you know, I was in Venice not a couple of years ago, and I was trying to find a, a kosher restaurant that had been recommended to me by someone who didn't keep kosher. Well, that's the highest recommended <laughs> recommendation can you get for a kosher restaurant. And so I got fablunge, you know, mixed up in the, which is easy to do when you're walking through the canals and, and streets of Venice. And I saw three guys in front of me, tourists, it was hot as heck that day, and they're all wearing baseball caps. I said, I'm following them, and they led me right to the kosher restaurant. <laughs> so baseball caps sometimes don't work so well, but people are moving the mezuzot from outside their door to inside their door, and I can't tell you yes or no, but whatever degree you are, you know, whatever degree you feel comfortable, don't go underground. You know, if you feel threatened, I'm not saying you, I'm not saying you should be brave and then you suffer the consequences. But um, we learned this certainly from the gay community. It's never safe to live in the closet. It's never healthy to live in the closet. Um, and unlike, you know, uh, people of, of uh, color, particularly uh, blacks, you, you have a choice, we have a choice, those of us who, those Jews who are white, and of course there are many Jews who are not, um, but if you, don't live defensively, you know, um, and if I can give you an element of what we call in Jewish tradition, chizuk, you know, uh, strengthening, um, as a historian, there is no logical reason why there should be Jews on the face of the earth. 
If you think back to the persecution starting Alexandria, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, uh, Rome, um, uh, Protestantism of the, of the Crusades, of the Chalnitsky pogroms in, in Eastern Europe in the 16th, 17th century, of the, pog of the pogroms in the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, and of course of the Shoah doesn't make sense that there still are Jewish people on the face of the earth. But we're here, we've survived, and we're going to get through this. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Lipstadt. Thank you.